Okay, folks, uh, why don't we get going here? Uh, it's my great pleasure to uh, welcome all of you oh. to uh, this afternoon's Notre Dame uh, International Security Center uh, seminar. Uh, we have a great uh, talk and a great guest uh, whom I will introduce momentarily. Uh, but first, a uh, couple of uh, administrative things. Uh, first of all, uh, I have a seating chart. Um, and uh, this is not to uh, take uh, take the role or, uh, you know, even to uh, take retribution for any untoward comments you might make during the uh, discussion. It's simply so I can recognize people by name. So uh, I'll pass this around. Uh, secondly, um, there are a number of people in the audience uh, who uh, I think are new to uh, end this program. So if you want to get uh, on our uh, mailing list, uh, please put your name and your uh, email uh, on this list. And uh, I promise you uh, we will only sell it uh, for the highest bidder as part of our uh, fundraising effort uh, for uh, Endisk. Um, Finally, um, we have a number of people who have uh, joined us virtually, and we want you to be a part of the discussion. Uh, it's a little bit of a hassle to try to uh, let people, um, you know, uh, talk directly um, during these sessions over Zoom. But if you want to uh, to uh, interject a comment or a question for our uh, uh, speaker, uh, please send me a chat um, on the uh, uh, Zoom link and I will uh, get it into uh, the mix. So the topic of today's uh, seminar is the progressive equity in the restraint coalition. Um, and this is, uh, I think, a very, very timely issue uh, for uh, Endisk. Um, you, uh, for those of you who haven't sort of followed the history of uh, what we've been doing, um, since 2016, a big part of the intellectual agenda uh, of the Institute uh, has been focused on uh, questions of grand strategy. When and how uh, should the United States um, use military force to advance its interests around the world? And a number of the people that have joined the Institute um, in recent years, particularly my friend and colleague, uh, Gene Goltz, have sort of carved out a position uh, for themselves in the grand strategic debate uh, on behalf of a grand strategy of uh, restraint. But restraint uh, turns out to be uh, a, uh, a broad uh, political coalition. It's uh, not to say where Gene sits on the political spectrum, it's impossible actually to uh, identify it. Um, but uh, there are a lot of people from, you know, sort of uh, on the right uh, libertarians and even paleoconservatives to uh, folks on the left who found a uh, common cause uh, in a uh, grand strategy of restraint. And sort of the uh, poster child uh, of this was uh, the establishment of the Quincy Institute for Responsible Statecraft uh, in Washington, D.C. It's headed by uh, Andy Basevich. Uh, a retired professor at Boston University, uh, a colleague of David and Atalia's uh, many years ago when he was a, uh, a Kroc fellow. Um, and the Quincy Institute, uh, you know, uh, has attracted a, a very broad range of people who are on the masthead, um, but also a pretty uh, a strange bedfellows uh, uh, list of backers, including George Soros uh, on one side and Charles Koch uh, on the other side. So uh, the Quincy Coalition is an interesting uh, political uh, uh, movement as well. Um, and the final thing I, I'll say before I introduce our guest and shut up is that uh, I've been thinking a lot recently uh, about the uh, 
Quincy Coalition and the Ukraine crisis, uh, where at least uh, the debate generated by uh, our old friend John Mearsheimer um, has uh, uh, generated not only pushback from the uh, predictable uh, neocon and sort of uh, establishment inside the Beltway folks, um, but also a lot of people on the left who I think probably agree with him, at least on some other issues, uh, have had problems with this argument. So the timing, and in fact, I, I, it's a tribute to Matt Doss that he delayed coming uh, for uh, about a month uh, until all these issues could crystallize uh, enough to uh, uh, be able to uh, speculate about uh, the future of the Quincy Coalition. Um, Matt's a uh, graduate uh, with two degrees from the University of Washington, both uh, undergraduate um, and a graduate degree from the Jackson School. Are you from the Pacific Northwest? No, I'm from uh, New York. Oh, New York. Okay. It's a long way to go uh, to uh, school. I didn't um, go there for school. I went there for other things and just ended up at school there. But uh, I okay. enjoyed it very much. Uh, I see. I'm not going to press too, <laughs> too deeply into, yeah, that's, into that's for the That's for the off-the-record session. Yeah. <laughs> Um, he uh, spent time at the uh, Center for American Progress, a uh, very influential uh, sort of democratically inflected, Democratic Party inflected uh, think tank um, in Washington. And in fact, one of the things uh, that uh, Matt sent along as uh, pre really had a very interesting uh, discussion of sort of the uh, the dynamics of that. Uh, he left there and became president of the foundation uh, for Middle East peace, but I think he's best known uh, for being a uh, legislative assistant to uh, Senator Bernie Sanders with primary responsibility for uh, foreign policy and national security issues. So, uh, Matt, thanks for making the long uh, two flight, uh, <laughs> got to make a transfer uh, trip from uh, Washington. Uh, out here to uh, South Bend. So please join me in giving Matt Dust a warm Thank you. But no, again, thanks uh, to the Notre Dame International Security Center, Center and uh, Professor Desch for inviting me today um, and for suggesting the uh, subject of the talk, uh, the Progressive Equity and Their Strength Coalition, because it's actually something I've been thinking about for a long time. Um, having had the, the opportunity, the privilege of playing a role over the past years in the development of this coalition and its mobilization and growth over around a, a number of initiatives, uh, particularly relating to the U.S. Uh, participation in the war in Yemen and the war powers resolution um, that was offered by Senator Sanders and his colleagues, Senator Murphy and Senator Lee, uh, among other issues. So even before Russia's attack on Ukraine, I think this was already a propitious time to discuss this subject. I think so much of what has been taken for granted uh, in U.S. foreign policy really is no longer. I think the last few years have shown that so much of what was treated as the unassailable consensus in U.S. foreign policy was in fact quite assailable, um, in part because I think Washington foreign policy elites and foreign policy professionals had convinced themselves that the consensus was, actually, was far more deeply rooted in popular support than it turned out to be. And that, I think, is one of the things that Trump's election revealed to us. It not, did not cause it, but it certainly revealed that I think the political consensus around a range of political issues, including foreign policy, uh, was much uh, more shallow and weaker than uh, was, was thought. Um, so the contest to define uh, this new consensus was already well afoot, and it was already, I think, quite urgent for those of us who favor a different approach to engage in that debate and help to shape that consensus. Um, but the events of February 24, by which I mean, of course, the Russian invasion of Ukraine or the further invasion into Ukrainian territory beyond that, which would have already been invaded in 2014, I think has made this tragically even more urgent. In a column on March 11, reporting from Berlin on the seismic shift taking place in both German and European defense policy, New York Times columnist Michelle Goldberg wrote, quote, Putin has murdered a whole constellation of post-Cold War assumptions. No one knows what new paradigms will replace them, unquote. Now, one of the dangers, as I see it, is the replacing of post-Cold War assumptions with Cold War assumptions. 
Um, the danger is that rather than develop a new paradigm for a very different era in which power is arranged very differently, we will simply exhume the old paradigm, put a tuxedo on it, and teach it to sing putting on the ribs. <laughs> Who gets that reference? Okay, that, that's why I got invited to speak here. Yeah. <laughs> okay, it's from Young Frankenstein. You've all failed. Um, but no, go see Young Frankenstein. It's one of the funniest movies ever. Um, because the truth is that old paradigm is what helped deliver us to this moment. Um, so I think it's desperately important for us to develop a different paradigm encoded with a different set of values and guided by a different set of policy imperatives. Um, or to put it simply, the future of our democracy depends on it. So no pressure. <laughs> um, what I'd like to do here uh, uh, is talk a bit about the Restraint Coalition to define it as I see it, what it agrees on, some of the things it disagrees on, and what ultimately I see as some of the potential limits of this coalition, and then what progressives in turn propose perhaps differently than from some of our um, more conservative colleagues in the coalition. So before we talk about the coalition, maybe we should just talk briefly about restraint. I'm sure you've studied you know, the various definitions of restraint. Um, but just in brief, the argument is that by defining pretty much everyone's business as the United States' business, there's really nothing that goes on in the world that can't be defined by some or another motivated and well-funded foreign policy entrepreneur as an important US foreign policy concern. Those of us who consider ourselves part of the restraint coalition or of the restraint tendency believe we should stop this and that US, we should define US foreign policy interests more narrowly and be far more cautious about using the military as a tool for advancing those interests. I think the, one of the leading academic proponents of restraint is MIT's Barry Posen, who wrote a 2014 book helpfully titled Restraint. Um, he defines the approach as such, quote, the United States should invest its scarce military power in the maintenance of an ability to access the rest of the world and should reduce its regular military presence in the rest of the world. Um, it's more complex than that, but I think that is a, one of the very good descriptions. We should do less um, because in trying to do more, we produce a lot of bad consequences and it's also, it's also extremely expensive, blood, treasure, and in its politically corrosive effects. Um, on our own democracy. And I think that latter point is something that progressives, I think, feel very strongly about, particularly. Um, so while Posen offers one of the more prom prominent academic explanations of restraint, I think we can find other examples of this developing approach even earlier. One I'll note here is a February 2013 foreign policy speech at the Heritage Foundation by Republican Senator Rand Paul of Kentucky, in which after reviewing some of the previous decades' disastrous misadventures, he argued that, quote, a more restrained foreign policy is the true conservative foreign policy, as it includes two basic tenets of true conservatism, respect for the Constitution and fiscal discipline. We can go back a few years earlier than that for an example of this impulse from the other side of the aisle. Uh, in January 2008, when the Democratic primary between Senator Barack Obama and Senator Hillary Clinton was still raging, Senator Obama took the opportunity during a debate to explain his opposition to the Iraq war. He said, quote, I don't want to just end the war. I want to end the mindset that got us into the war in the first place. Now, my friends make fun of me because I, I quote this all the time. Um, I think it is one, just a great one sentence encapsulation of what I see as a progressive foreign policy project, but I think it also works for the broader restraint oriented foreign policy project. You know, people will have differences in the details, but as a basic idea, it's the it means that it's not just this one discrete policy. It's not just this one intervention or that intervention. It's an entire set of illusions and preconceptions that surround American power and its uses that are wrong. And I think ending this mindset uh, is probably the main project of the Restraint Coalition. And the separate question, one I'll come to a bit later, is replacing it with what? So I think perhaps more than any other, the one the restraint approach is most identified with, as Professor Desch pointed out, the Quincy Institute for Responsible Statecraft, uh, funded in part by both Charles Koch and George Soros, founded in 2019. Uh, the Quincy Institute is named for the former president, John Quincy Adams, who sounded the famous warning that America, quote, goes not in search of monsters to destroy. Um, the speech he gave as Secretary of State in uh, July 1821, often cited by restrainers as a kind of guiding light of American foreign or their vision of American foreign policy. Um, there are a range of other policy organizations, advocacy organizations that have been working together in a kind of loose coalition for well over a decade around these issues. 
um, on the right, and I'll use the terms left and right very loosely. Um, there are groups like Defense Priorities, Concerned Veterans for America, and Freedom Works. The Libertarian Cato Institute has been doing very good work, often very lonely, for a very long time on these issues, and I think their collection of scholars defies a sort of left-right easy categorization, but I think they deserve a lot of credit, you know, Chris Preble and people like Justin Logan and their team for having been at this work and raising some very difficult questions for a long time. And I want to make sure they get that credit um, because I think more and more people have joined this debate um, on those terms. I think on the left, you have a larger set of groups operating of, of a frankly smaller pool of resources. Um, but I think it is powered by a real kind of movement oriented sense of activism. And I do think that's a bit of a difference that we might see. Uh, between what, again, I loosely call the left and right, just to name a few is Win Without War, Move On, Action Corps, Code Pink, Common Defense, Demand Progress, Foreign Policy for America, Indivisible, uh, Peace Action, a very partial list. Um, I've left off some important groups with very close friends. Um, but believe me, these groups do not agree on everything, even within the kind of progressive world. Um, but they've developed a very healthy sense of respect for the shared work. Um, and the need to try and, and, and work out differences in as constructive a way as possible, given what we're all up against in, in, in you know, a Washington where interventionism is still very much the order of the day. So I think these groups represent a really key part of the progressive theory of the case, that fashioning a new and durable foreign policy consensus requires a much more active coordinate, coordination between local grassroots organize, uh, organizers and these so-called policy professionals. Um, and that kind of interplay and engagement and coordination, I think, is very, very key to how progressives, including myself, um, are approaching our work of trying to shape a new foreign policy approach. So what binds the conservatives and progressives and the restraint coalition together? So I think the, the effectiveness of any coalition is going to be measured in its ability to actually influence the policy debate and ultimately change policy. Um, the initiative that probably best exemplifies this is the work around the 2018 Yemen War Powers Resolution, which was led by Senator Sanders, along with Democrat Chris Murphy of Connecticut and Republican Mike Lee of Utah. That resolution, which passed the Senate in, uh, in late 2018 and then passed again in both the House and Senate in early 2019, before being vetoed by President Trump, rested on two key points. First, that the Saudi-led coalition's war in Yemen, um, originally launched in March 2015, had led to the world's worst humanitarian crisis. Um, and that the U.S. needed to stop contributing to that crisis, at least. Uh, second, that U.S. support for that war, be which began under the Obama administration and was then increased under the Trump administration, qualified as, quote, participating in hostilities, unquote, as laid out in the 1973 War Powers Act, and thus had not been authorized by Congress and was illegal. That's what made the uh, War Powers Resolution an appropriate tool to address uh, U.S. support for the war in Yemen. So here, concerns with expansive and unaccountable executive power, acting outside the bounds of the Constitution, the weakening of congressional authority and oversight, and the actual popular mandate and legitimacy that oversight is supposed to provide. A deepening humanitarian crisis created by U.S. partners armed with U.S. weapons, acting with U.S. support. These are the shared concerns that help mobilize the transpartisan coalition, coalition excuse me, behind the Yemen War Powers Resolution. In more general terms, I think what binds the restraint coalition together in the first instance is a suspicion and critique of the existing foreign policy establishment. The sense that Washington has gotten far too comfortable using the tools of violence with far too little consideration of the consequences of that violence or of the framers intention to constrain its use by requiring popular consent. In Washington, there's a way you're supposed to talk about foreign policy. There are certain presuppositions about American primacy, about American power, American intentions, and American leadership that often just go unquestioned. What binds this coalition is the shared understanding that those presuppositions should be challenged because policy approaches based on them have undermined U.S. and global security rather than advanced security. Restrainers have a shared appreciation for unintended consequences, understanding that because military violence leads to so many outcomes that we can neither foresee nor control, American foreign policy needs to dramatically de-emphasize military power. I think there's a shared understanding that the global war on terror has been a disaster in economic and human terms, in strategic terms, and that we need to move away from it. It wasn't just that the Iraq war that was a mistake, and again, this goes back to Obama's quote, 
it was a mistake that grew out of an entire conception of American power that was mistaken. Now, obviously, the establishment does not take this sort of criticism lying down. It's called the establishment for a reason. Um, it's not uncommon to see concerns about restrainers alleges, quote, isolationism. Anyone who promotes, promote, you know, proposes the crazy idea that we have fewer wars will often be, be attacked with this. Um, but I think it's, you know, when you look at what, you know, restrainers propose, um, which is, I think, a much more vigorous kind of diplomatic agenda versus a military one, um, it's, it's revealed as both silly and kind of a sign of how screwed up our foreign policy debate has become. And I think part of it is just we've become so used to using or to talking about the military tool, so used to proposing all kinds of military interventions that we've become so, or at least so many policy professionals have become so deeply indoctrinated in this policy culture of global military hegemony that they can't really think seriously about anything else. They've been listening to death metal for so long that now even Led Zeppelin sounds like smooth jazz. <laughs> I think a great illustration of this is a 2013 New York Times piece, a piece which warned, based on a, on a recent on a poll, this is 2013, that quote Americans are exhibiting an isolationist streak, with majorities across party lines decidedly opposed to American intervention in North Korea and Syria. While the public does not support direct military action in those two countries right now, a broad 70% majority favor the use of remotely piloted aircraft or drones to carry out bombing attacks against suspected terrorists in foreign countries. All right, so let's think about that. If you only support bombing unspecified foreign countries with flying robots, that's isolationism, according to this article. Further illustrating the crazy isolationist fever infecting the American people, the New York Times quoted poll respondent Pat Bates of Missouri, who said she would, quote, hate to see us trot into yet another country and try to fix things when we're not quite sure what we're doing. That's madness. <laughs> I mean, who, who could imagine such craziness? I mean, of course we should just run into countries when we're not sure what we're doing. But anyway, if you find that sentiment outrageous, there may be a job for you in American foreign policy. <laughs> <laughs> to the extent that the American public's so-called isolationist streak, I would call it, I think, a more a renewed appreciation for restraint. But to the extent that new sense is a reaction to the war on terror's aggressive and expansive interventionism, I think it probably deserves to be listed among the war on terror's few positive achievements. I think the challenge for restrainers now is how to encode that sense of restraint into a new and durable um, foreign policy consensus. So what are the limits of the restraint coalition? What are the restraints, what are the limits of this, this partnership? Um, I think looking at some of the debates around the U.S. response to uh, Russia's invasion of Ukraine, we can already see some of the strains here. Um, I'm not going to talk about Mearsheimer, but I think we definitely can get to that in the discussion because I do think it's interesting. Um, you know, in my view, I think, interestingly, the Biden team is actually handling Ukraine fairly well. This is, in my view, not... The team or the president? Well, you know, the president up until a few days ago. <laughs> um, you know, that... That gaffe aside, and I think that was very unfortunate, but I do think the team is handling this pretty well. Um, it's not true in many other areas of foreign policy, but a responsible, you know, progressive position on Ukraine, I think, is more or less what Biden has been doing. He's been clear about the limits of U.S. involvement, communicated those limits clearly to Vladimir Putin. He's also put the United States and its allies squarely behind a democratic country defending itself um, and defined the U.S. interests in, in doing so. I think some of our conservative colleagues might take a much narrower view of the U.S. interests here, asking what does it really matter to our security if Russia takes Ukraine? Isn't that just the way of great powers throughout history? Um, in my own view, a progressive vision of foreign policy seeks to create a genuinely rules-based international order, understanding that is an enormous task, um, but it's something worth trying. Um, you know, but I would distinguish that actual rules-based order from what people in Washington mean when they say rules-based international order, because my view on the rules-based international order is, is something like Gandhi's response when he was asked what he thought about Western civilization. I think it would be a good idea. <laughs> you know, I mean, this is something you hear a lot. It's one of the rules-based international order. People love talking about it in, in Washington, but part of actually defining and defending such an order requires acknowledging that the United States has done quite a lot to undermine that order. 
That's not to say we're uniquely bad. The United States is not uniquely bad, but the United States is uniquely powerful and influential. And, we, and when we decide that rules against torture don't apply to us and our friends, when that rules against invading and occupying other countries don't apply to us and our friends, that rules against assassination don't apply to us and our friends, that our people can commit alleged war crimes with impunity while others must face international justice. This completely discredits the idea of a rules-based order. Just for example, last August, there was a US strike in Kabul, Afghanistan, killed 10 people, including seven children. The US military initially called, claimed that this was, quote, a righteous strike, but was forced to admit otherwise only after being confronted with volumes of evidence that it could not deny. And it should be obvious the US would have continued to deny this if, if it could have. Um, uh, an investigation afterward found that while the deaths were tragic, the correct process was followed. The appropriate lawyers had signed off with the appropriate, appropriate legal opinions, and therefore no one would be punished. Um, and that's just not satisfactory. Um, if you're telling me that the system worked when the system shredded seven children, um, I don't accept that. I mean, there's been a lot of talk recently about an investigation into Russian war crimes in Ukraine, and I think this is a good idea. But it's worth noting how little credibility the United States actually has to call for such an investigation, given that we have stridently opposed any such investigations into our own actions, whether in Iraq or Afghanistan, or our close partners' actions, whether it's Saudi Arabia and Yemen, whether it's the UAE and Yemen, whether it's Israel uh, in the Palestinian territories. So I think one of the main ways that the United States showed Putin and other, other war criminals around the world that they can get away with it is by letting our war criminals get away with it. I'm not equating what the US did in Iraq and Afghanistan with what Putin is doing in Ukraine, but I think if we're serious about an investigation into Russian war crimes, as we must be, then one of the best things we can do is cooperate with similar investigations into our own alleged war crimes. So I think another area of some disagreement or tension within the coalition has to do with the, uh, you know, where we put human rights on the agenda. Uh, in the same 1821 speech in which Quincy warned Americans not to go abroad in search of monsters to destroy, he proclaimed that the United States was, quote, the well-wisher to the freedom and independence of all but the champion and vindicator only of her own. Now, I like the first part about not seeking monsters, but that second part there is, is not enough for me. I'm not satisfied to just stand over here and kind of shake my pom pom for freedom without you know, trying to do something for it. I think the first and best thing Americans can do for the cause of human freedom and democracy is to defend those values here at home um, but we do have considerable tools and influence with which we can support these values around the world. Um, the question is, what are those tools and how realistic is that and where and how do we use those tools? I think from a progressive perspective, contrary to what some of our more hawkish critics claim, I'm going to steal this one. It's yours. Um, We've already taken it out of your honorary. <laughs> <time, so. laughs> mm. it, it was worth it. This is the best water. Um, a genuine reckoning with the post 9-11 period won't spur a U.S. withdrawal from the world, but a deeper engagement with it. I think the main challenges of today, the coronavirus pandemic, climate change um, among them are shared. Um, and the, the U.S. needs to commit to a sustained and genuine multilateral approach to meet these challenges rather than continuing to unilaterally abrogate and undermine the norms and conventions that we ourselves helped to establish. Um, you know, I think, unfortunately, the skepticism on the part of a lot of people that, um, you know, very reasonably arose in the wake of the Iraq war and the war on terror um, is often accompanied by, I think, a reflexive suspicion that any supports for human rights is simply a fig leaf for imperialism or domination. Um, and again, these supports, these, these are not baseless concerns. George W. Bush declared his freedom agenda only after his other justifications for the Iraq war had fallen apart. Uh, the Trump administration justified its economic strangulation of Iran and Venezuela with un unconvincing appeals to human rights in those countries. And even the Biden administration, which uh, loves to make statements about how, quote, human rights is back on the agenda, has done very little to demonstrate that that is, in fact, the case. Um, but, you know, I do will not, you know, all efforts to promote human rights are not cynical. Um, and I think it's, it's worth thinking about what people in a lot of these regions around the world, like the Middle East and elsewhere, have made clear. I mean, the people of Ukraine are making clear what they want. Um, 
So again, I think it's, it's worth thinking through how we can support those efforts. A genuine accounting of the last decades of US foreign policy should engender, again, a strong sense of humility about our ability to produce grand transformations, especially through military force. We have neither the ability nor the right to change other countries' governments, let alone transform their societies, but we can embrace an ethic of solidarity and use our considerable diplomatic and economic power to defend the rights and freedom of people in other countries who are working for positive change themselves. Um, to effectively advance the principles of free and accountable government abroad, however, the United States, again, has to practice them at home. Um, and I think this gets to another key area of tension is democracy reform here in the United States. Even as we survey some of the dangers around the globe, I think today uh, many would acknowledge, I would, that the greatest threat to the United States comes not from any terrorist group or any great power, nor from a pandemic, uh, but from our own politi political dysfunction. I think Donald Trump's presidency was a, both a product and an accelerant of that dysfunction, but it was not its cause. Uh, the environment for Trump's political rise uh, and the movement he, he led and continues to lead was prepared over decades of xenophobic, messianic Washington warmongering. And I think the roots of this movement obviously go back even farther into centuries of American white supremacist politics. What progressives bring, I think, is a recognition that in order to have an actually effective foreign policy, we need to fashion a new and durable political consensus, a new shared understanding of what the American political project actually is. And to do that, we need to address some of the deep and enduring problems in our society. Part of this is the understanding the racial and economic, and economic inequality here and militarism abroad are mutually reinforcing. I think the 2020 protests in the wake of George Floyd's murder and the, and the crazily militarized police response should have made that abundantly clear if it wasn't already. The January 6th attack on the US Capitol should have made that clear. Um, so, you know, one of the tensions within the coalition has to do with our understanding of the enduring legacy of racism in American democracy and the necessary steps to address it. Democracy reform may not at first seem like a foreign policy issue per se, but again, building a genuine new small d democratic consensus on foreign policy requires an actual democratic process. And I think right now in this country, we continue to come up short. As you may know, the Senate failed to pass two major pieces of legislation on this, the For the People Act, which passed as HR1 in the House, uh, which would have curbed voter suppression, making it easier for all Americans to register and vote and cast a ballot. It would have outlawed partisan gerrymandering of con congressional districts. It would overhaul our campaign finance laws and combat corruption. I mean, our campaign finance system uh, is just corruption by another name. It's just one of these things that everyone agrees in Washington that we're not going to call corruption, but is, it is pretty much straightforward bribery. Um, you know, unfortunately, this bill and these efforts have stalled for the moment, and there was a whole lot of money behind the effort to stall them, um, you know, including some of the friends like Charles Koch, who funds some otherwise very good foreign policy projects. Um, projects that I have and will continue to, to work with. But I think it's worth noting uh, some of the efforts um, that they're supporting. This, this network spent tens of millions backing many of the senators who are opposed to these voting reforms. Um, and again, I don't mean to be disrespectful to my hosts at all. I'm very happy to be here, but I think I would not be fully and responsibly addressing the subject of this talk if I didn't note this particular tension, because it does point to a pretty important and consequential dis disagreement within the restraint coalition around pretty foundational values of democracy and pluralism. Um, I think this is a good segue into the next area of tension, combating oligarchy, corruption, and inequality. I think as the US and, al and our allies have ramped up sanctions on Putin and his government, um, a lot of attention has been paid to the quote, oligarchs a crew of extremely wealthy individuals with close connections to Putin himself, who basically helped Putin manage the enormous wealth that he has extracted from the Russian people and hidden in various places around the world. I think we should step back for a minute here and remember the role that the U United States and US economists themselves played in the rise of the oligarchs in the first place. After the collapse of the Soviet Union, you know, there was an extreme form of neoliberal economic shock therapy that was imposed on post-Soviet Russia and a new class of investors were able to essentially buy up and take control of the Russian people's resources at bargain prices. These became the oligarchs. 
And then in one of the all-time great histor historical, all-time historical bad bets, these oligarchs saw a former mid-level KGB officer named Vladimir Putin as a sufficiently pliable successor to lead Russia, that, a Russia that they controlled. Uh, Putin was, of course, able to consolidate his own power in part by effectively exploiting popular outrage at the economic devastation created by neoliberal stock shock therapy and bring the, the oligarchs under his own control. And we should also note that it wasn't the first time the U.S. ran this scam on a country, and it wasn't the first time that it produced authoritarian outcomes. But if we only go after the Russian oligarchs, I think we will have failed. Uh, I think we need to think about actors here in the U.S., the lawyers, lobbyists, and consultants, and elsewhere, like the U.K., which is another, another destination for uh, some of this uh, ill-gotten wealth. Uh, these are the folks who are making lots of money themselves by helping kleptocrats and oligarchs stash and launder their money. Um, and U.S. laws continue to help um, all of these folks, whether they're from Russia, from the U.S., or other, other parts of the, of the global south, um, helps them hide and launder their wealth in places like Delaware, Nevada, South Dakota, or in real estate in New York, Miami, and other places. Um, you know, we have oligarchs of our own in this country and people who use their enormous wealth wealth which was often gained by rigging the system in their favor to exert continuing influence uh, over our political system. And if we're serious about defending democracy, I think, in the U.S. or around the world, the concentration of economic and political power by a privileged few is a problem we have to think about. We have to confront a system that produces oligarchs and sustains and protects their undemocratic control over our economic and political life. Finally, a big one, a big source of tension, climate change. I think progressives understand that the science is clear and we need to accelerate as much as possible a renewable energy transition away from fossil fuels. And, and let's be clear what we're talking about here. And I just don't want to undersell the radical nature of what progressives are proposing. We're talking about destroying billions upon billions, perhaps trillions of dollars in potential future wealth. Um, I'm going to refer here to a 2014 piece in The Nation by journalist uh, and TV host Chris Hayes called The New Abolitionism, um, where, where Hayes compared the modern climate action movement to the, the movement to abolish slavery. So I want to stress here that Hayes does not, and I do not, draw an equivalence between slavery and the use of fossil fuels. Rather, the comparison here is between what opponents are proposing and I'll quote Hayes here, quote, because the abolitionists were ultimately successful, it's all too easy to lose sight of just how radical their demand was at the time. That some of the wealthiest people in the country would have to give up their wealth. That liquidation of private wealth is the only pre precedent for what today's climate justice movement is rightly demanding, that trillions of dollars of fossil fuel stay in the ground. I'll add here there's also a very clear national security rationale uh, for this, which I think has been made even clearer by Ukraine. Um, the sanctions imposed on Russia are already pretty severe, but an even more severe thing we could do would be to transition away from fossil fuels toward renewable energy as quickly as possible. Not only would this deny Putin the revenues he requires to stay in power, it would also spare us the spectacle of the United States going hat in hand to our corrupt authoritarian petrostate friends for help against our corrupt authoritarian petrostate adversaries. Uh, as we've seen in the past weeks with various US officials making the trip to Saudi Arabia and UAE, begging them to put more oil on the markets to offset Russia's energy being taken offline. So to close here, I'll just, I'll just say, I think we should recognize that we are at a real inflection point. And I think people tend to overuse that, but I think it, it's quite true right now. On March 10, UK Foreign Secretary Liz Truss said, quote, the invasion of Ukraine is a paradigm shift on the scale of 9-11. How we respond today will set the pattern for this new era. Now, I think this is right. And I think it's desperately important to make the right choices now as we made so many of the wrong choices in the wake of 9-11. The devastating effect on the world and ourselves. Uh, in a recent interview with the Washington Post, Greg Sargent, Francis Fukuyama, uh, the academic uh, who's known for um, the end of history, um, described this moment in the following way. Quote, the spirit of 1989 went to sleep, and now it's being reawakened. I do think people like the idea of struggling for a just cause, and they really haven't had anything other than consumerism and mindless middle-class pursuits in the last 30 years. Now, I don't agree with that. Um, 
I think the last 30 years have actually seen quite a bit of revolt against consumerism and mindless middle-class pursuits. And I'm thinking here about the global justice movement, which protested the WTO, the World Bank, and the IMF in 1999 and 2000. This was a global South-driven activist movement uh, that put itself on the agenda through some really important direct mass action protests. Um, and that was unfortunately suppressed in part by 9-11 uh, and the radical shift in focus to counterterrorism. But these ideas and these activists and, and, and what they propose has not gone away. We saw similar ideas echoed in the Occupy Wall Street protests. We saw very similar ideas in a different context animate the Arab Spring protests in 2011 and 2012. Outrage at corruption, unresponsive government, austerity, environmental destruction, elite self-dealing, protests against the rig game. In 2019, there was yet another wave of uprisings around these same ideas in around the world, in Chile, Haiti, Lebanon, Iraq, Hong Kong, and elsewhere. Those are just a, a partial list. A mass global mobilization against corruption, austerity, and repression. Again, unfortunately, this movement was big-footed by the pandemic. But I think we need to understand that addressing the crisis of legitimacy that is fueling the global authoritarian wave will require heeding these voices in the streets, these activists, primarily in the global south, but also in our own country, both at home and abroad. Desperately important that we not lose sight of this now as the foreign policy establishment moves to make anti-Russia, anti-China, anti-authoritarianism into the new hotness while continuing to turn a blind eye to the sources of authoritarianism everywhere, the sources of authoritarianism. So to wind this up, I'd like to quote uh, from a piece in Foreign Affairs last June by Senator Bernie Sanders, warning against the rising new Cold War mentality in Washington. Quote, the Biden administration has rightly recognized the rise of authoritarianism as a, as a major threat to democracy. The primary conflict between democracy and authoritarianism, however, is taking place not between countries, but within them, including the United States. And if democracy is going to win out, it will not do so on a traditional battlefield, by, but by demonstrating that democracy can actually deliver a better quality of life for people better than authoritarianism can. That is why we must revitalize American democracy, restoring people's faith in government by addressing the long neglected needs of working families. We must create millions of good paying jobs, rebuilding our crumbling infrastructure and combating climate change. We must address the crises we face in healthcare, housing, education, criminal justice, immigration, and so many other areas. We must do this not only because it will make us more competitive with any other country, because it will better serve the needs of the American people. So if there's one word I'd leave you with here that I would use to characterize a progressive foreign policy approach, it's that word solidarity. Solidarity with those working to build better, more secure and dignified lives within our own communities here in this country and those doing so abroad. The key question is how we translate that solidarity into a foreign policy that recognizes the limits of power, but also uses the considerable power we do have to promote human dignity and security around the world. Well, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, so the floor is open and uh, also the chat window um, on the uh, Zoom screen uh, for people who want to get in. And uh, so uh, raise your hands. I see uh, signs of life from my, uh, my colleague, Dan Lindley. Um, and anybody else who wants to uh, get into the uh, queue for discussions. Um, uh, by the way, um, the, uh, we will give you, when you're recognized, we'll give you a microphone um, just to uh, ensure that all of this is captured for the folks online and for posterity. Dan. Is it on? Yes. What a miracle. Um, so I'm wondering if you consider Trump a fellow restrainter, a fellow traveler in your circles, because certainly in some elements he was. Um, also, do you think he'll pay any political price in the coming election for being completely an idiot about Russia? Right? All of a sudden, the Republicans have just gone whoosh, yeah. on Russia, on NATO. It's been remarkable. So is that, hmm. is that a political movement or something that's just going to blip and go away? Yeah. I mean, two good questions. The one is, I think there are elements of his foreign policy, which one could call a restraint. I think, you know, Afghanistan, the decision to withdraw. Um, I think his decision to engage with North Korea, I think my boss was, I think, the only member of the Democratic caucus to actually say good things about that, even though it produced nothing, it ended up being a little more than a photo op, but, you know, 
that kind of diplomacy is important. Um, and he, I think he deserved credit, even if his motives might not have been perfect. And I think that was worth doing. Um, you know, I think part of what I think Trump, how do I put this? I think Trump is, has smartly identified kind of popular discontent with a whole range of policies. Like, like I was saying earlier, I think he revealed that the, so, the so-called consensus was not actually a consensus. Um, you know, Trump is, has repeated the, the phrase, you know, great nations don't <clears throat> fight endless wars. You know, just this, the frustration with the idea that we had been in these long-term military interventions. And he tapped into something very real on foreign policy. Um, I don't know that it was bound together by any real theory of restraint, but I think you can definitely identify things that he did that are consistent with restraint. So if that answered that question. In other areas, he was quite militarist and unilateralist. I mean, I think to name one of many examples, the assassination of Qasem Soleimani, which brought us as close to a war with Iran as I think we've probably ever been. Um, so I think that was a, an extremely reckless, in addition to an illegal um, act. As to, you know, it, I'd be just basing, looked at how Trump has weathered so many <laughs> alleged mistakes over the course of his political career. I'd be shy. I mean, everyone thought that his campaign was over when he disrespected John McCain. You know, everyone thought you can point to so many other um, situations where it's like, oh, man, it's over. He, he's done it now. And it turned out he didn't. It turned out that what he's offering to his base um, has, is kind of, you know, it, it's not about this or that policy position. You know, I mean, he is, he is an emblem uh, for them that just, it seems like impregnable. So what about the, uh, you know, the, the possibility that the Trump phenomenon in 2016 and the Sanders phenomenon uh, in 2016 uh, in the old Venn diagram, you always or often have yeah. a uh, uh, overlap subset. Um, and uh, uh, many, you know, people have pointed out that there's good evidence that folks who voted for Barack Obama in 2008 and 2012, at least a s significant number, may have voted for Donald Trump yeah. in, uh, in 2016. Probably people who, uh, uh, at least some of whom would have voted for Bernie Sanders mm -hmm. if he'd have gotten the, uh, the nomination. So if you sort of add all those groups up, yeah. th there was something really cooking yeah. um, in, uh, in 2016, maybe not uh, unlike the uh, Quincy coalition that you've uh, been talking about. Yeah. Um, you want to say a little bit more? About sure. It? No, I mean, I think it is, it's, it's, you know, I think some of, uh, some of our critics would like to overstate that, that similarity, but it's very real. You're right. And I think it's, it's driven by a popular, um, distrust and a popular revulsion at what they see as out of touch, corrupt, self-interested elites in Washington, a system that is not working for them, a system that is not taking care of their community and, and providing an opportunity for them and their kids. Um, and, you know, the, the, the data point about uh, Obama to Trump voters is interesting, but what's also interesting, if you go back to 2008, you can find evidence, you know, this is from some of its anecdotal, some of it's stronger, but like canvassers who were, were, you know, talking to people, you know, and some of these people were straightforwardly racist. These were white, white racists who were still going to vote for Barack Obama because compared to the other candidate, he was the one who was challenging the system more. And that is what was important to them. Here's someone who's going to shake it up. You know, and I think that's the same, you know, that's, those are the kind of voters who both Sanders and Trump drew from. Now, obviously, I, I think uh, Bernie offered a kind of more uh, constructive <laughs> and unifying vision of what we're going to do when, when we hang all the bankers. Um, <laughs> but um, not hang them, it's going to imprison them. Um, but you know what I'm saying. I mean, Trump, Trump took that very, very real sentiment and, and did some, I think, very destructive things with them. Um, but I think, you know, Senator Sanders and some of, you know, some of his colleagues who in, you know, what we might define as the progressive movement are saying, listen, this, this discontent is real and it's not illegitimate um, because we're, we're not taking care of our folks, not taking care of our people. And um, people have a right to expect more from a government and a country that is this enormously wealthy. Um, 
Gene Goltz is next. Hi, um, thanks for the conversation. I'm going to resist, at least till dinner, the temptation to stick up for some of the less progressive parts of the restraint coalition. Um, My good friends. Yeah, um, but uh, I, I, I like a lot of your emphasis from the progressive side on the renewal of America or the commitment to American democracy. Um, you know, that's kind of always been a key part of the restraint argument. And um, it posits something of a, of a trade-off in political attention, in budget commitments, in um, the career trajectories of smart, talented, energetic, entrepreneurial Americans getting you know, pulled one way by necessity as opposed to reinvigorating our society and this, this idea that there's a trade-off and if we did less militar, mil, militarily, internationally, it would give us resources to figure out, to have a debate about what to do domestically, you know, about, you know, progressives and conservatives would differ about what the recipe would be, but then we could actually engage that debate. Um, sort of one of my original fellow travelers in this academic argument uh, has become quite discouraged. Um, uh, he doesn't, I guess, the, by the dysfunction in contemporary American politics. So the idea that if we did less internationally, we could turn attention to actually addressing some things in the United States mm -hmm is one of the core attractions of restraint. But if you're not going to get that because the American political system is, you know, whatever, whatever the cause, the diagnosis, the disease is broken. Like we can't face debt issues, concentration of wealth issues that you raise, uh, race issues. Like, um, is it plausible to imagine a constructive, national debate and policy solutions to these things that would, you know, from the, it's the John Quincy Adams Society coffee mug that I have here, right, that, that would go back to the other part of the JQA speech about America as a beacon mm -hmm. for a well-functioning republic, mm -hmm. right? Um, so I don't know, what are the, like, imagine we win on Yemen and Syria and Iraq and whatever else that you think that, you know, North Korea, da, 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 da. How does that translate into not consensus, but right. a, a, a positive um, debate? Yeah. No, it's a good question. I think, first of all, I mean, arguing for better policies that produce better outcomes. Um, and I'll, I'll just be honest, it's, it's frustrating how much actually producing those better outcomes often doesn't carry the day. I mean, a great example is the Iran nuclear agreement. Uh, I just think there's no question that that was a very, very good and strong non-proliferation agreement. Um, but nonetheless, it was opposed ideologically by a very strong, very, very well-resourced coalition, um, despite the fact that it achieved everything it had set out to do. Um, but I think it's building up, um, building up kind of a, a case file of, of positive outcomes that we can point to. But at the same time, I mean, I actually don't think that, you know, I think there's nothing, even if we have the best possible policy approaches, I think, in some of these areas, I actually think it's kind of impossible to get the media not to light its own hair on fire when crises arise, you know, whether it's Afghanistan, whether it's, Ukraine, I, I think it's it's very difficult to change. I think changing the media's culture of, you know, conflict sells, um, and crisis sells is actually more difficult. I think than, um, you know, proposing that okay, we need then having you know, political leaders in Congress and elsewhere who are actually going to try and deal with these crises responsibly, if that makes sense. Um, yeah, but I think I don't really see one necessarily weakening or strengthening the other. It's just they both have to go in tandem to make those good policies durable, right? Because even if we do get a new interim nuclear agreement with Iran, as it looks very possible that we might do, 
of the danger right now is that the next Republican administration will simply withdraw from it again. And that is just not a sustainable way to run a foreign policy. So that really gets to the question of can we have an approach that's durable and rooted in a real consensus. And I don't downplay that challenge, but it is kind of the core one. Great. Uh, thank you. Alex, you're next. Hello. Thanks for the wonderful talk. So you've covered a number of important major areas of disagreement within the restraint re camp. Mm -hmm. But one thing that was less emphasized within your presentation is this issue of the rise of China. Mm. And namely, I'm thinking about this issue in three dimensions. Mm. What, if any, is the type of threat slash problem mm -hmm. that China poses to the US? Yeah. Two, what is the appropriate or what are the appropriate alliance slash defense commitments that the US should be taking up vis-a-vis yeah. -vis, uh, the, the rise of China? And three, the appropriate broader US grand strategy that the US should be taking against China's rise. Yeah. Um, so can you share your assessment as to the basic fault lines within the restraint camp? on the, these basic issues moving forward. And just to you know, better help me flesh out the foreign affairs read ahead piece that you did yeah, share sure. um, ahead of the seminar. Thanks. Right. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, it's interesting because we were, Professor Desh and I were talking about this earlier. I mean, I think you can certainly identify people who one would group in the kind of restraint coalition like Professor Mearsheimer, who's actually very hawkish on China. Um, I think you have others, um, who would identify themselves, identify themselves as huge fans of John Mearsheimer, who would take a, a less hawkish view. Um, I think, you, you know, you, you mentioned the piece from Senator Sanders, which I quoted uh, in, in my talk as well, is, first of all, yes, it's important to understand what China envisions for its own role in the world. And I do think there is still some question about that. I think the consensus that seems to be fast forming in Washington and including in the White House, um, um, is kind of characterized by Russ Doshi's book, The Long Game, if you're familiar with that, um, which takes a very kind of, you know, basically that China wants to supplant the United States as the global hegemon. Um, whether it wants to do it quicker or, or longer, um, I think is, is still in question. Um, I think there are others who disagree with that, who see, you know, China wanting to kind of just actually have freedom of movement in its own region. Um, but either way, I think that debate is still going to play out. But I think Senator Sanders' point is like, if it's one or the other, that there's still an argument for working in every possible way to develop some measure of trust and working relationship with China, right? There is no argument for simply, you know, defining this relationship as a conflict and a confrontation at all times. Um, you know, because even, even, even if even if the worst interpretation of China's ultimate or the Chinese government's ultimate goal is the right one, there are still things to be learned um, from engaging with Chinese officials um, at, at all levels, uh, things that will help us develop better and smarter policy uh, in responding uh, to some of those aims. Um, but I think uh, another really important, I think equally important part of that piece and what he was proposing, and I think this is kind of shared amongst a lot of the restrainers, is, you know, the you know, it's dangerous to imagine that we can forge political unity in this country through conflict with China or with Russia. You know, we you know we saw this during the war on terror, the idea that okay, we're going to all come together after 9/11 and unify. Uh, and wave the flag and go to war in the Middle East. Um, that was a disaster, not just for people in the Middle East, but in the way that this kind of discourse, you know, demonized Muslims in our country, the way it, it hurt our own communities through militarization, through surveillance, um, and it, it corroded our own politics with a very hawkish, xenophobic, um, you know, kind of rhetoric. And we can already see this happening with regard to China. And I think a little bit less so with regard to Russia, but you can find examples of it. Um, and I think that, you know, if, if we're, you know, if the understanding is that we need to repair our own politics and our own democracy to have an effective foreign policy, then being wary of the way these, you know, our foreign policy act actually kind of blows back on us is really important. Thank you. Um, David Courtright. Yes, thank you, Matt, for the great talk. And uh, I agree with your point about the Biden administration's response to the Ukraine war uh, as having been generally uh, restrained and properly so. 
in making clear that uh, we're not going to introduce our forces. There won't be a direct confrontation, military engagement between U.S., NATO, and, and Russia, while at the same time providing uh, ample, you know, large volumes of defensive weapons so they can mm -hmm. knock out Russian tanks and the like uh, in a proper self-defense. Um, but uh, now we face uh, the, uh, the aftermath. Hopefully there's a negotiation here, which might be a ceasefire. This is going to take a, a time to unravel, but um, uh, well, let's assume that it doesn't get worse. Uh, but we now face the backlash in various countries of uh, significant increase in military spending and a move towards militarism. Right. Right. I mean, even the Germans <laughs> are not right. talking about right. increasing their military spending. Uh, I thought and, it was three Reichs and you're out. <laughs> <laughs> oh, <God>. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, and then the, the headlines, I haven't read any of the details yet on the budget proposal, but 10% increase of the military yeah. is on top of all the increases we've been right. the last two years. Right. Uh, it's a staggering amount um, and is highly problematic for a lot of reasons. Uh, but now we have a challenge politically in the restraint coalition, both sides, to come up with a response here that's going to work politically. Because it's, it's easy to understand the fears that many have of Putinism, properly so, and especially if you're living in Poland or the Baltics. Uh, who knows where this madman may turn next, and you're right in the potential uh, target zone. So. Uh, they need help to defend themselves, et cetera, and that argument will under, underlie and build support for this huge increase in militarism. Uh, and I can think of lots of arguments why it's not going to help them and, and uh, why it would be actually counterproductive and would have a lot of negative effects, but can you help us out with, you know, what's the political argument you were saying at lunch, which I agree with? Yeah. It, the argument has to be on questions of principle. What is the best security? Yeah. So, yeah, we should defend people who are threatened by Putin, but what's the best way to do that without spending another 150 yeah. billion more on top of our already large military spending? Yeah, well, I mean, honestly, I think the best response to this idea that we need to spend more money to counter the Russian military threat is this military, this Russian military <laughs> that we've been watching for the past month. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I'm, I'm not kidding, I mean, um, I, you know, the, you know, the kind of military industrial complex will obvi always, always obviously seize on any reason, uh, to increase the defense budget. Um, there are more than enough think tanks and fellows and pundits who are, you just kind of, and again, this is the kind of culture that I talked about in, in, in my talk. Um, so I don't, I think it's more, more than, than the threat from Russia, because I think, yes, and the actual threat from Russia is the fact that they have the most nuclear weapons of any country in the world. Um, that's not, not something we're going to necessarily deal with through increasing our military budget. But I think the excitement around the fact that Europe is, quote unquote, taking its own defense seriously now um, is, is, is very concerning. And again, this is, you know, I've been in meetings with colleagues, a number of colleagues from Germany and Europe who've come over and, you know, very serious defense analysts and people who are now, I mean, you can feel like the room buzzing with energy because now we're all agreeing to get serious about defense by spending more money on, uh, on the military. Now, you know, a lot of good friends of ours in the Restraint Coalition have written things about Europe's strategic autonomy. I think that's an interesting debate too. Um, what does this mean if they develop more capabilities on their own? Shouldn't that mean that the United States is then able to do less? I think that's a pretty easy argument to make. Um, so yeah, I think I don't. I don't see this as actually a more difficult argument to make than it was before. I just you know, except that you know, a lot of the folks who make these arguments are just kind of invigorated uh, by what we've been seeing, because you know, and I will say there is something positive about you know, the work that's been done um, by the Biden administration and allies in Europe to kind of maintain unity and to build and to maintain a united front. Um, but, you know, as I was saying at our lunch, I mean, my question is, like, where was this work on a whole range of other issues before this? Like, we, we see what you can do when you decide you get your back into building unity and working with Europe. Why weren't you putting this kind of energy into vaccinating the global south? 
or any number of other issues that are, have, that are enormously important to our security? Why does it take something like this to, to really wake you up? Uh, Emily? <laughs> Thank you. Um, so I just wanted to thank you first for coming and speaking. I found your comments really insightful. Um, so my question is basically about what can be used as kind of the ethical foundation for um, the progressive movement and restraint. So I'm really interested in this idea of a decolonial global ethics, mm -hmm. which I think does dovetail really nicely with the progressive movement in a lot of ways when it comes to things like um, critiques of the international human rights regime and things mm -hmm. like that. Um, but one thing is that it sees siloing away global conflicts as something that is strictly confined to one area as irresponsible, particularly when you are a global power that yep. has engaged in colonial activity and are thus responsible for at least some element of this conflict, which the US has a power that has yeah. engaged in some colonial activities over the past couple of centuries definitely is. So given this, my question is, uh, do you think decolonial ethics could be used as a basis for solidarity that you were talking about um, while still adhering to a strategy of restraint? And what would this look like in practice? Yeah. No, I'm going to give a short answer, but it's a great question. And I think the answer is, is yes. I mean, at least from a progressive perspective, they talked about, you know, first of all, I think what there's strong agreement on in the coalition is that the, the foremost responsibility of any government with regard to foreign policy is to promote the security and the prosperity of its people. Um, but I think as a progressive, you know, I define my responsibilities, my obligations don't end there. You know, I feel I define my own obligations as I do have a responsibility to people around the world because our lives and our futures are bound up together. And that's not just kind of a woo woo, hey man, one love, one world. You know, that's, that's a real understanding I think progressives have. And again, the question is, you know, what are the tools and policies that we use to actualize that? Um, I think there was something really interesting. I don't know if people saw the, um, in the wake of the, uh, the Russian action on February 24, the speech by the Kenyan representative um, at the United Nations. I would really encourage you to go watch it. Um, there were, you know, they were voting on a resolution condemning the invasion. And the Kenyan representative, you know, made the point, like, listen, in Africa, our borders were imposed upon us. We did not write them ourselves. They were imposed upon us by, by imperialist powers. Um, and we've decided to operate within those borders that were imposed upon us because if we went about trying to set right um, all of these borders, we would, the bloodshed would never stop. Um, and that's not just true in, in Africa, of course. I mean, I, my training was in the Middle East where borders were literally drawn by a French and a British diplomat on a, on, on a map. Um, but I think that's the kind of, and I think this goes, when you know, we talk about a decolonial ethics, I think um, working to build a multilateral system that doesn't just kind of reach out and talk to voices from the global south, but actually puts them on the Security Council. You know, that is not just, you know, as a colleague of mine put it, they're not just served the food, they're not just welcome to the table, they are welcomed in the kitchen. Um, so that's just a short answer uh, on that. Great. Uh, Matt Kearney? Yeah, hi. what I was wondering, I guess, in your opinion and in your experience, what has been effective to get people, I guess by that I mean kind of decision, make, decision makers, politicians, kind of onto the restraint bandwagon and out of this establishment mindset that you were talking yeah. about? Like, what, what's been effective in doing that? Um, well, Voting them out of office is always <laughs> is always a good one. But short of that, um, you know, political pressure. But I will say, you know, we talked about this again earlier. It's like one of the most important ways of, you know, creating moments for education and, and change is by giving members of Congress something they need to vote on, something that they will have to say yes or no to. And I think that was part of the project of the Yemen War Powers Resolution was to use the tools of the War Powers Resolution, which was it using the tools of privilege, right? Because Congress is completely dysfunctional right now, in case you didn't know that. Um, it's very difficult to like propose and get bills to the floor. Um, but the War Powers Resolution has certain tools um, that enable any member to force this bill onto the floor for at least one vote. And it may lose that vote, 
but there will at least be one vote that every member of Congress has to raise their hand yes or no to. And when a member has to vote and go on record for or against something, then they need to learn what they're voting for. Their staff has to educate themselves to help and then in turn educate their boss. That creates opportunities for activist groups, for advocacy groups, for experts to weigh in. It just creates you know, an educational moment. And those are the, creating those opportunities is how you can slowly move the needle. Two finger from Gene. Yeah, so I, I think that's an excellent point, right? There are lots of streetcars that come by of opportunities to, and you got to have some people who grab each streetcar and, yes. and work. You need a bench of people who have the energy and the work mm -hmm. to. You have to have more people because the establishment has lots of people yes. that's are going to be educating on every yeah. issue. But so that that's the question. The the um the reaction to Ukraine, Putin is evil. We have to resist Putin. We need a new Cold War. Um, has been so different than say the reaction to Yemen. So the political resources that right. come right. So. Um, the Yemen War Powers Resolution lost mm -hmm. um, at the veto level, but um, uh, like, how could there have been a more perfect opportunity for a victory that didn't come to pass, right? Like the Saudis don't look good. They cut up a guy living in America mm -hmm. who was a journalist exercising free press rights. Mm -hmm. They lured him to an embassy and literally cut him apart with a bone saw. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the new Atlantic cover story says all kinds of things about how we, you know, the, the regime is implicated in this. And yet we can't disentangle ourselves mm -hmm. from their aggressive war in a neighboring country. Mm -hmm. um, so, um, I don't know. I mean, to me, the the you can compel a vote, but the how do you? What, why is the reaction so different to Ukraine from yeah. Yemen? And how can you overcome the establishment teaching moments or whatever it is? No, I mean it's 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 a good question because you're right. You know, the Saudi and UAE have essentially been doing in Yemen what 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 Putin's uh, been doing in Ukraine. I mean, but we also have to recognize the U.S.-Saudi relationship is deeply, deeply institutionalized in Washington. Um, and I'm not just talking about lobbyists, consultants, and think tanks. It's just this is the way even, you know, even other people, you know, like people who would define themselves as progressives, um, you know, foreign policy professionals, you know, they're like, well, okay, they're not great, but we need them for X, Y, and Z, mostly pumping oil. Uh, and that is changing. I mean, but your question is a good one. I just, I'm, I, you know, I'll just kind of, Hope I won't be seen as punting on it just to say the work, it's, it's long and hard work. Um, but I think if you look at the attitude <clears throat> toward this relationship in Washington now versus five years ago, it is seriously different. And you better believe the Saudis understand that. The Saudis allies in, in, in Washington understand that the work of lobbying right now is much, much more difficult for Saudi Arabia. So. I mean, Russia doesn't have that kind of lobbying expertise. The U.S.-Russia relationship is obviously very, very different for a whole range of ways. Um, but yeah, you know, it's, it, it, it takes a while. So if I don't see any other hands, you guys are going to have to listen to the distinguished moderator uh, recognize himself and go on a stem winder. Um, <laughs> but seeing, <laughs> please. <laughs> What do you think? Don't encourage them. <laughs> Is this thing not? Okay. Uh, two things. One, thank you for the talk. It's always great to hear from a more professional point of view versus, you know, fellow students. But my question is, you talked a lot about American support for democracy both here and abroad. Mm. But let's look at the real world. We're going to have to support an authoritarian regime or two simply because it better serves our interest to do so. For instance... Saudi Arabia, it's in our interest to support them because imagine if that global supply of oil goes over to the Chinese. Um, basically, my question is, to what degree do you think this is acceptable? Do you think even if we support these regimes behind the scenes, we should try and exert influence to encourage liberalization and democracy? Yeah. 
So to the first point, yeah, you're right. As it currently stands, we are kind of trapped or held hostage by our continued reliance on fossil fuel in this relationship. Now, even, and that again is why I think accelerating the transition to renewables, um, go ahead. Uh, even outside of our reliance on fossil yeah. fuels, just yeah. purely based off, we don't want the Chinese to have those resources. No, it's, it's a fair question, but we're gonna have a lot more leeway um, to define our own policy um, the more we move toward renewables. Um, as you, you know, energy is a global market, so the Saudis, by virtue of their enormous reserves, are always going to have an enormous amount of influence um, on that. Um, so your, your question, we need to have a relationship with them. Yes, it does not to be, need to be this relationship um, where there's virtually no pressure being applied to the Saudis. Um, there's been various times when we have tried to apply pressure and various different Saudi leaders have responded in different ways. So yeah, I think you, the basis of your question, aren't there kinds of trade-offs with bad governments that we need to work with? And the answer is yes, sometimes yes. But let's work harder to define that space smaller <laughs> um, and not just accept it as, okay, this is just a cost of doing business as, as, as we have been doing. I'm just, I, think, I think there is a way to kind of shrink those tensions uh, a bit more than we have been doing. But yeah, those trade-offs are always going to exist. We shouldn't pretend they're not. So the students are filibustering to keep me from having my say. Uh, we'll recognize Alec uh, Hahos. Uh, yeah, uh, <laughs> I guess not to sound um, defeatist, but I think Eugene brought up a good point. Um, you know, if, if we can't, and, and you say that things have changed since Yemen, you know, they're different now with Ukraine, but really for the restraint coalition to, to win uh, and to beat the establishment, I mean, is it really just going to be a function of the structure of the system biting back? I mean, America's had sort of, you know, it's, it's drunk on its own power mm -hmm. uh, and it's going to take the hangover to actually finally wake uh, the American political establishment up out of that yeah. uh, sense of delirium. So, I mean, it's, I know that's leading, but um, hmm. is, is that what your assessment is? Or do you think um, there is space for change before we get to that rock bottom moment? No, I think there is space for change. Part of it is having more and more members of Congress who are willing to, to voice those ideas um, and to give cover to others who might agree with them but have not been willing to kind of get out there on that. Um, and I'll also say this, I mean, <laughs> Ultimately, what is going to, what changes seriously, what really impacts um, kind of foreign policy discussions, some more, some less, is a president. Um, if we can conceive of having a president that considered herself or himself, um, or at least considered the restraint, if not, if they didn't consider themselves a restrainer, then at least considered the restrainers a much more important part of the coalition that elected them. Um, and brought some of those people into their administration. Um, that is something that seriously uh, changes the overall foreign policy debate in Washington. We don't have that now, unfortunately. We've got a few good folks, um, not nearly enough. I mean, there's good folks, but they don't share these ideas as much. But I think continuing to build the presence of these ideas in Washington such that these are the kinds of people that get attached to presidential campaigns and get appointments in future administrations and then come back out into Washington and kind of continue to carry the flag for these ideas is really how you do the work of changing the debate. So um, one of the other fault lines, uh, I think, in the coalition that you didn't touch on, and uh, I hesitate to raise fault lines because I'm all about building yeah. momentum, um, but uh, uh, sort of intellectual candor compels mm -hmm. me uh, to raise this, um, we realists tend to have a tragic view, uh, both of human nature mm -hmm. and of politics. So uh, you see it, you know, for for example, in uh, the Mearsheimer position on the uh, on the Ukraine, um, but you see it on a on a lot of other things as well. Um, you know, I I. I did spend a lot of time in Russia in the 90s. Uh, 
uh, I saw a lot of the turbulence of the uh, Yeltsin period. I knew a lot of you know people who were involved in it, both you know foreigners who were there and Russians who were part of the reform reform process. And there were there were certainly a lot of crooks and gangsters mm -hmm. who were trying to make a lot of money. Yeah. Um, but there were also, I think, a lot of well-intentioned people uh, who you know, thought that uh, democratization, liberalization of the economy um, and things like that um, were morally um, praiseworthy. Um, the problem wasn't, uh, I think, that we went in there thinking we were going to screw this country mm -hmm. over. I mean, there were probably some people who thought that, but just, you know, a lot of people who, uh, you know, their good intentions paved the road to uh, to hell with uh, with uh, with Russia, um, and you see it, you know, in a lot of a, a lot of other instances as well. I mean, sort of the flip side of that is, uh, you know, there's been a lot of sort of burnishing of uh, Ukraine uh, recently. Uh, you know, we talk about Ukraine as a uh, democracy. Mm -hmm. It's more democratic than Russia, but that's damning <laughs> with, with faint praise. Uh, you know, President Zelensky, in my view, has risen to the occasion, but he, he really was a political failure mm -hmm. in terms of his agenda when he was elected in April 2019 yeah. in terms of resolving some of the big problems right. uh, in that country very corrupt place um, and um, you know there's no genocide in the Donbass but there is a minority rights problem mm -hmm. um, that right. Putin's probably going to solve by carving all the Russians out of uh, a, a future Ukraine um, but you know there, there was also uh, you know a period of time uh, after you know sort of between the March on Charlotte and the uh, uh, the uh, uh, January 6th um, assault on the Capitol, where people said, you know, there's a real political problem with a global, uh, maybe not neo-Nazi movement, but, you know, certainly uh, very ugly nationalist right movement mm -hmm. that was strong in Ukraine mm -hmm. and unfortunately remains strong there. Yeah. We don't we can't really talk about yeah, that because right. you know we're in the the mode right now of you know basically um casting president Zelensky as the 21st century um manifestation or reincarnation of the founding fathers mm -hmm. so it's that you know general tragic view that you know a lot of what we do wrong mm -hmm. in the world in my view was well intentioned yeah and, and also, a lot of the places and people that we'd like to work with aren't as good as our propaganda sort of makes it out to be. Yeah. And so that's what I think leads a lot of the, the, the uh, those of us in the realist camp um, in the Restraint Coalition to embrace JQA, uh, you know, without the codicil that you want to add mm -hmm. to. We wish other people well, but whenever we try to do well, or often when we try to do well, uh, we end up, mm. you know, making things uh, worse. Yeah, I think the progressive side is far more optimistic and far more uh, meliorous. You talk to Charlie Kupchin, uh he thinks we can convert NATO into a collective security institution that'll be somehow become the concert of Europe. Uh, mod two, uh, you know, those of us on this side think the original sin of the current yeah. crisis was, was NATO expansion, and anything that involves NATO going forward is not going to be a, a solution to the to the problem. So, um, do you agree that that's a uh, uh, a significant issue that divides us? And uh, uh, you know, why? should we not be as pessimistic as uh, as many of us are about yeah. transforming global politics? And right. all that maybe in one minute. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you.
Um, Dave, no. David's blocking out. He's, he's heard that. Yeah. <laughs> um, no, I mean, there's a number of very good questions in there. I'll try to tick through them and ignore the ones I want to ignore. Um, or you can walk out with Dave. <laughs> <laughs> no, first of all, with regard to Russia in the 90s, yeah, I mean, you know, I gave a little gloss of what happened. Um, I, there certainly were well-meaning folks who went over there and, and thought what we were doing was correct. Um, certainly not every economist or every activist or democracy promoter who went over there after the fall of the Soviet Union was a kind of hands rubbing Mr. Burns who just wanted to kind of, you know, extract wealth from, from Russia. Um, I would say that, you know, people who tried the, these approaches in other places, you know, a lot of people who did what we did in Chile <laughs> genuinely believe that we were saving Chile from communism. Um, you know, Elliot Abrams believed that we were saving El Salvador from communism by killing lots of nuns, um, you know. So yes, people can do horrible things with what they believe are the best of intentions. Um, your point about Ukraine is also very important too. Ukraine, it, it is, um, it is a, it's a relative, relatively less uh, smaller corruption problem, but it certainly has its own corruption, it has its own oligarchs, you know, because that same model was sort of imposed on Ukraine just as it was on Russia. So yeah, I do think it's important not to, you know, I think, you know, Zelensky has earned admiration um, I, don't, I, I don't think that should blind us to some of his own shortcomings or the challenges that Ukraine definitely still has, including, you know, in, in the Donbass, as you said, this minority rights issue, which is very real, which his own government had not responded very productively to. Um, you know, we were talking at lunch also. I mean, listen, Ukraine does have a right-wing neo-Nazi uh, problem. Um, you know, a lot of countries have a far-right neo-Nazi problem, including our own. Um, we don't happen to be at war right now with, with these neo-Nazis roaming around in, in uniforms like the Azov Battalion. Um, but yeah, we had absolutely have to um, acknowledge that. The picture is more complex than I think our debate often makes it out to be. As to your last point, and, and it's a good question, I think it's more, it's, I think there maybe is just, in, comes in some ways a difference in degree in what we believe our actual capacity and ability is to support or facilitate change and around whether it's our business. And listen, if people believe it's not our business, that is a good faith disagreement um, that I have with some of my more conservative colleagues. Um, but again, the reason I bring up the kind of, you know, um, global justice movement that we saw back in 99, 2000, and the way that has fed into some of these other rounds of protests we've seen in the US and around the world, as I think, you know, there is work that we can do on our own, um, but also working with other institutions, multilateral organizations and other countries to at least try to protect the political space in these countries for these activists to do this work. You know, even if we're not, you know, sending, you know, a bunch of American activists to help change these societies, which we absolutely, absolutely shouldn't do. There are activists who, who do seek and ask for American help, even if it's just as simple as, you know, the consul general, you know, scolding, <laughs> the, you know, the local authorities or at least making clear that we're watching what you're doing. Um, you know, that's the kind of that's a small thing we can do, but I, I do think there's more. So it's, yeah, it's being kind of modest about our ability to produce change, but understanding we do have some tools that we can do to at least protect the space in these countries for them to do the work themselves. Great, and uh, we, we're a little past time, so I think we should uh, formally uh, close the proceedings, but not before uh, a round of applause for uh, Matt Thank you.